All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just uh, hanging there for a brief second. I'm just going to allow our attendees to roll in. Um, and then we'll, we'll get started in just a second. We appreciate your patience. All right. Um, hi, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first day of the 40th Annual Public Interest Environmental Law Conference. Uh, we're so happy to have you today. Uh, my name is Reza Sadegzade, and uh, I'm a third year law student here at University of uh, Oregon. I, along with uh, Michelle Matson, would be um, your moderator for the duration of this panel. Um, and before we get started, I just want to uh, go over some uh, quick housekeeping matters. Um, first and foremost, we want to acknowledge that the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Elihi, the traditional indigenous land of the Kalapuya people. And um, also, I just want to give a quick reminder to not to worry if you can't see yourself. Um, this is a Zoom webinar and all of our attendees are automatically muted with their video off. That way you could dedicate all your undivided attention to our panelists. But please uh, feel free to submit any questions you have using our um, Q&A function and our panelists uh, will address them at the end of our panel today. And um, as you may uh, already know, um, for the past 40 years, this conference has been organized by uh, University of Oregon law students. And um, this year's conference would have not certainly been possible if it wasn't for all the hard work of our current students. Um, just wanna give a quick shout out to all of our current um, conference co-directors and all of our first year law students who uh, were part of this endeavor. And, uh, and a special thanks to uh, Jesse Gardner for, for putting um, this, this panel together for us. And um, if you would uh, like to further support our students, you can always donate to Friends of Land and Water um, they're a nonprofit organization made up of our alum, and all your contributions are actually um, turned into stipends for our first and second year law students who are um, deciding to do unpaid internship work for public interest um, environmental uh, organizations like the, the ones uh, we have today with us. And uh, uh, one last thing, um, all of our panels will be uh, posted and recorded um, on our YouTube channel where you can find all the other um, panels as well, in uh, addition to the ones from last year. And um, you know, our, our YouTube channel is a great resource for our audience. Um, and you could easily access it by just uh, looking up Pilk on, on YouTube. And uh, please make sure uh, to subscribe and, and, and like our videos. And uh, without uh, further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our three wonderful panelists um, who uh, are gonna be discussing um, Oregon's conservation efforts um, uh, for the greater good uh, today. And uh, we have uh, Danielle Moser from uh, Oregon Wild, uh, Zaristi uh, Camella from Defenders of uh, Wildlife, and uh, Quinn Reed from uh, Center for Biological Diversity. And I um, thank you all for being here with us today. All right, can I go ahead and get started with sharing my screen? Great, perfect. Um, before I just share my screen, I'll just say hello to everyone. My name is Quinn Reed and I'm the Oregon Policy Director for the Center for Biological Diversity. I'm also a member of the Governor's Environmental Justice Task Force. Um, quick housekeeping note, um, we've organized this panel so that we have about 15 minutes um, at the end for Q&A. So um, please feel free to you know, type your questions in the chat or, or save them to the end and we can have um, a nice conversation at that point. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. Just give me a moment. All right. So 
Um, you'll hear in a moment from my colleagues, uh, Daniel Moser with Oregon Wild and Shristi Kamal with Defenders of Wildlife. Uh, the three of us work very closely together in the Oregon Wildlife Coalition. Uh, this coalition includes our three organizations and six others, um, all of us working to improve collaboration and to advance stronger, better, and more inclusive wildlife policies in Oregon. So, oh, and just a note, that is a picture of my son, Malcolm, at a uh, rally for Oregon's wolves. I had that for a previous presentation and thought, you know what, he's still cute, I'll include it. Um, so I live and work in Portland on the unceded lands of the Chinook, Clackamas, and Cowlitz people. Today, we'll be talking about our work to ensure that Oregon has abundant, thriving wildlife and why advocating for more equitable and inclusive institutions is such a big part of that work. But we have to begin by acknowledging that this system, this system that I work in every day with Danielle and with Shristi to improve policies for wildlife, is rooted in our country's colonial origins and the exploitation of the people who were the original stewards and protectors of the land and its wildlife. So wildlife populations are crashing around the world. I apologize in advance, it starts with a lot of doom and gloom. Um, and we're facing an unprecedented extinction crisis. Um, scientists predict that more than 1 million species face extinction in the coming decades and estimate that we lose approximately one species per hour. It's really almost impossible to comprehend. Uh, this crisis is entirely of our own making. It's the result of more than a century of habitat destruction, of pollution, um, the spread of invasive species, wildlife exploitation, which includes the legal and illegal trade in wildlife, um, climate change, certainly, population growth, and other human activities. You know, my colleagues and I work every day in ways big and small to try to stop and hopefully reverse this catastrophe. Um, if you're interested, I have here, you can visit savelifeonearth.org to learn more about the center's um, Saving Life on Earth campaign and what we're doing. Um, but the reality is that we all work in the confines of a biased, out-of-date, and limited system of wildlife management. And it's a system that originated to elevate certain interests and values and explicitly to exclude others. Losing biodiversity at the scale undermines the life support systems that we all depend upon. Uh, this includes pollination, uh, water purification, oxygen production, and disease re regulation. Um, and low income, under resourcing communities of color bear the brunt of these impacts. Yet, we rarely talk about the link between conserving biodiversity and environmental justice. A perfect example and a very recent and painful example of this link is COVID-19. So COVID was and, and continues to be devastating to people across the globe, but it hit low-income communities, indigenous communities, and communities of color particularly hard. Uh, COVID and other highly contagious diseases like SARS, Ebola, and avian influenza are all zoonotic diseases, which means that they spread from animals to people. Something like 75% of all new emerging infectious diseases originate with animals. So what's driving this? Um, we can really look at our broken relationship with biodiversity. Climate change, habitat loss, industrial agriculture, wildlife trade and trafficking, and other human activities all put humans into closer proximity with wildlife. And this creates many opportunities for disease to spread. So as a brief aside, um, I'm very happy to report that the governor just signed House Bill 4128 yesterday. And this is a bill that will provide Oregon with practical tools to prevent and respond to zoonotic disease outbreaks, specifically linked to the import trade and handling of wildlife. Um, if you're interested in learning more about that, I'll put my contact information up on the last slide at the end, and please feel free to get in touch with me later. Um, it's almost certain that the next pandemic will start with animals and it's going to hit the same under-resourced communities the hardest. You know, intellectually, I think we all understand this, but in our system of wildlife management, and even within the conservation community itself, there's this pervasive, stubborn idea that protecting wildlife and biodiversity is somehow separate and apart from environmental justice. So 
there's a lot to unpack here. So let's talk a little bit about how this wildlife management system originated. You know, it's really important that we understand how decisions are made and who makes those decisions. We have to increase our understanding so that we can better navigate these systems of power and so that we can influence policy. But more importantly, we have to increase our understanding so that we can dismantle and remake these power structures to be equitable and inclusive. Um, today, authority over wildlife conservation and management, uh, quote unquote management, in the US is shared between the federal government and the states. Within the states, there are generally two governance models. In one, you have a board or a commission that makes policy decisions and oversees an agency. This is the model that we have here in Oregon. Um, in the second model, you have political appointees that make policy decisions or just broadly oversee an agency. Um, but how did this system come to be? Um, we really need to look back to the European colonization of America. Um, so we just wanna do sort of a brief history here for you. Um, so the westward expansion of colonizers in the US was characterized by the brutal genocide of indigenous peoples and cultures and the completely unfettered exploitation of natural resources. As urban populations grew with this expansion, so too did markets for wildlife to feed and dress those populations. But I wanna be clear, um, these wildlife resources weren't destroyed just to meet growing demand by urban populations. It's in fact, um, wildlife that represented important cultural resources to indigenous peoples were specifically targeted and eliminated. It was another form of genocide. Um, at the same time, the spread of people and increased development destroyed habitat directly. Uh, predators like wolves and bears were killed as pests or as competition for game species. And by the turn of the 20th century, many species had been pushed to the edge of extinction or some over the edge. But there was another trend taking place around this same time. So as these growing populations accumulated wealth, we saw the emergence of a middle class and the growth of sport hunting. So this is not subsistence hunting. This is hunting primarily for recreation. It's a way for people with money and leisure time to reclaim some romanticized notion of the frontier spirit. Nonetheless, you know, with this uh, growing form of, of recreation, we also had a new and very vocal class of advocates who wanted to protect fish and wildlife and preserve these recreational opportunities. So starting in the, the mid to late 1800s, you know, conservationists, many of them sportsmen, uh, began to organize and advocate for the preservation of wilderness areas and wildlife. Um, in this picture, we have an image of the 1909 North American Conservation Congress. And this is a good example of the decision makers behind these early efforts. And, you know, I'd like you to take a close look at who's represented here. And more importantly, who's not represented here. Um, you know, this was really eye-opening for me. When I started working in this field, I just sort of took it for granted that this was a system. I didn't realize how intentionally it was designed to exalt certain types of hunting and fishing and certain types of people. Uh, you know, my family came to the U.S. as refugees during the Vietnam War, uh, fishing usually in, in industrial waterways and, and polluted waterways um, is a mode of survival for many refugee and immigrant communities. Yet, in all of the many commission hearings that I've attended and listened to over the years, I have not once seen the interests of refugees or immigrants represented at a Fish and Wildlife Commission meeting. Yet, nonetheless, you know, during this time, important laws were passed, um, including the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918, the Migratory Bird Hunting and Conservation Stamp Act of 1934, the Federal Aid in Wildlife Restoration Act of 1937, and the Federal Aid and Sport Fish Restoration Act of 1950. So collectively, um, all of these efforts and these pieces of legislation um, laid the foundation for what inspired what's now known as the North American model of wildlife conservation. So I'm going to take a look at this here. So one thing that's important to note about this model is that it's not legally binding. 
rather it's, it's more of a set of abstract principles. But this model nonetheless forms the basis of our current system of wildlife conservation and management. And it's widely accepted and quoted um, by wildlife professionals and agencies, Oregon included. So on its surface, and take a look at some of these points, um, you know, wildlife is an international research uh, uh, resource. Scientific management is the proper means for wildlife management. You know, it looks it looks pretty good, right? Um, and these efforts and the model, you know, undoubtedly helped restore populations of of many, though though mostly game species. But we need to acknowledge that our system of wildlife conservation and management, and this model that we still use today as the basis of wildlife management originated in exploitation and was written by and for sportsmen. And I use men intentionally uh, and, and to conserve species that they wish to fish and hunt. And this is not meant to denigrate sportsmen and women, but in this system, those who value wildlife for anything other than hunting or fishing are constantly facing an uphill battle to have their voices heard. And indigenous communities, low-income communities, under-resourced communities, and communities of color, whether they hunt or fish or not, have largely been excluded, even though they will bear the brunt of the impacts from the loss of biodiversity. The scale of the biodiversity crisis calls for a different system. You know, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Danielle to discuss the ways we're trying to influence this kind of change in Oregon. Um, and as I mentioned before, my, my contact information is here um, in case any of you have any follow up questions that we don't get to today. I encourage you to reach out. Thank you so much. Thanks, Quinn. Uh, give me a second here, everyone, to get my presentation going. Let's see. Always takes a second. <laughs> Great. Um, so yeah, thank you, Quinn. Uh, again, my name is Danielle Moser. I'm the Wildlife Program Coordinator for Oregon Wild. We are a state-based organization that's focused on protecting and restoring our state's wildlife, waters, and wildlands as an enduring legacy for um, Oregonians. So. Uh, yeah, and as Quinn mentioned, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it too, just the role that, again, Oregon Wild and the Center for Biological Diversity and Defenders have had in trying to reform these systems and these institutions that oversee wildlife conservation in the state. Um, so let's just dive right in. So Quinn kind of alluded to this, but I'm going to go a little bit further in explaining who are, like, what are the decision-making bodies in Oregon? Um, you know, I think a lot of times when I ask this question, people do kind of immediately go to thinking about a legislative branch, which absolutely is true and makes sense. Um, but really, first and foremost, um, the Fish and Wildlife Commission, which is the decision-making arm for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, is really one of the premier decision-making bodies in the state. And so I tend to lead with that because it's also one that's often forgotten. Um, but quite frankly, Quinn and Tristy and I spend a lot of time in front of this particular commission, um, you know, they rule on everything from, you know, hunting and fishing regulations to, uh, you know, which species should go on the state endangered species list um, to different recovery and conservation plans. So they have a wide reach. And so I just like to, to really point that out that that is a really important uh, entity and, and again, decision making body. Of course, then you have the Oregon State Legislature which, you know, depending on the day and what mood they're in, we're either trying to stop really bad legislation from going through or potentially work on some good stuff to help Oregon's fish and wildlife. And then at the federal level, of course, we have the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which, um, again, as Quinn mentioned, is, um, you know, similar to the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife in that, you know, they're part of the administrative branch. They obviously oversee, again, which species will be on the federal endangered species list. But unlike in Oregon, they actually don't have an extension of a decision-making arm. They sort of wrap up uh, decision-making in part of their review process with staff um, and with you know, political appointees at the head of the agency. So it is a little bit different and in some ways um, harder to kind of figure out how to advocate and, and who to talk to um, because there isn't sort of a, an obvious board or commission associated with them. And then, of course, at the federal level, we also have Congress, 
which similar to the state legislature, depending on the mood, depending on what political trades are being made, uh, we're either working to stop pretty bad legislation or again, hopefully work on some better stuff. And then finally, um, another, of course, entity that oversees, you know, the restoration of Oregon's fish and wildlife are tribes. Um, you know, they have sovereignty, they have their own councils, they make their own policies and rules related to fish and wildlife conservation and management. Um, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that going forward, um, their role to really restore uh, themselves as the lead and caretakers of Oregon's fish and wildlife. Um, so for today and for this panel specifically, I probably could talk for hours about all these different entities, but we're really going to focus our efforts to reform systems um, to the Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission and, you know, extending agency and the Oregon legislature. Okay, so what are the statutory requirements of the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and its commission? Um, it seems pretty straightforward, you know, their mission is to protect and enhance Oregon's fish and wildlife and habitat for president for you know enjoyment by present and future generations. Uh, it's always funny to us at Oregon Wild because when I read that I'm like, well that sounds exactly like our mission, <laughs> except what we see that plays out is usually vastly different than probably what we would say needs to happen. Um, so that's kind of the overall mission. And then I really want to point out this particular um, uh, policy, which is you know it's the policy of the state of Oregon that wildlife shall be managed um, to prevent serious depletion of any indigenous species and um, to provide the optimum recreational and aesthetic benefits for present and future generations of the citizens of this state. Um, and then following from this policy, there are, I believe it's seven co-equal goals, all kind of detailing what exactly is meant by that. But what's interesting about this, um, and even in the mission broadly is, you know, you read that and think, okay, seems relatively straightforward. The challenge is that we see a lot of tension between the protecting and the conservation and the you know, prevention of decline of species with that recreation. And obviously Quinn pointed out you know, some of the origins of that, but as we're trying to reform these, these entities and these institutions, we're really even trying to pick apart some of the language that we use and, and trying to figure out how can we show the agency and its commission where their emphasis, emphasis should be placed? Um, so for example, with this ORS 496.012, um, you know, there was even an opinion that was um, given to, by the attorney general in the early 90s to try to clarify this wildlife policy. Um, and at that time they said, you know, you can't actually, provide optimal recreational activity. You can't maximize our ability to hunt and fish unless, you, unless you've actually prevented species decline in the first place, right? Like you can't fish a bunch of fish if it's not an abundant species. So you really have to prioritize protecting those species before you can actually talk about hunting, fishing, otherwise killing those species. And so, you know, the AG issued this this opinion, and you would think that would mean, okay, great, we are ready to move, like they're going to prioritize conservation. But unfortunately, the agency, we still see a lot of that push pull, we see that tension still play out, in which they're still really prioritizing in policy in you know, and how they run their programs, you know, just this desire to have more recreational opportunities, and not so much prioritizing conservation. Um, you know, if I were putting on my ODF and W hat, I'm sure what they would argue is, well, we don't have enough funding to do conservation. Um, and, um, you know, a significant portion of their funds come from the sale of those hunting and fishing tags, come from sale of ammunition and other related um, items. And, you know, that's true. But at the same time, we've seen in front of the commission in particular, you know, opportunities for whether a species deserves, you know, more protection or what should the recovery plan be. And it's still, even in those instances, we see that prioritization of recreation of, again, sort of maximizing consumption versus conservation. So, um, you know, several of us are working on addressing the funding piece, but we still haven't seen that play out, you know, even in the way they talk about their own mission, even in the way they sort of put it out to the public what they care about. We don't often see them lead with conservation. So um, just wanna give that sort of overview to understand like, again, how we are trying to really unpack 
all of these things that have been going on for many years and, and try to reform them. So as it relates to the specific actual Fish and Wildlife Commission composition, um, so how is it put together? Uh, so for our commission, it is seven members serving staggered four-year terms. As of right now, we have you know, the five congressional districts. So we have one come from each congressional district. We have one member coming from the east of the Cascades, kind of an at-large position, and then one west of the Cascades. And what's interesting about this and what we have seen play out over and over again is while it has this sort of geographic distribution so that we're you know, taking and having people appointed to the commission that are sort of representative for the population size, um, because of course we've had issues with people representing you know, big um, plots of land versus actually representing people. Um, so while we did this for a geographic distribution, the fact of the matter is these commissioners aren't members of Congress. They're not representatives. They're not supposed to represent, you know, a one constituency or their, their district. Um, you know, they're not, uh, they're not elected like that. But what we kind of see play out is, oh, well, you know, I come from, I, I'm, rep I'm representing this congressional district and this congressional district cares about, you know, this special interest or this interest. And so I just want to clarify that because even though we have that geographic distribution, it's not because we're saying, yes, you are to represent, you know, just the values or just the interests of that group. Um, and then how does it work? Like, what is the enabling language? What is the language that actually says what the commissioners should be knowledgeable in? Like, how do we select these folks? Um, and I should say the way it works is the governor nominates candidates to the commission, but the state Senate has to approve those. And so that's kind of the interplay and, and where the legislature comes into, um, you know, comes into this decision-making space. But so all members of this commission have to represent the broad public interest. And you can see that in that first bullet. And so, um, you know, and obviously they have to be knowledgeable about the role of a board of commission, the fact that it is actually, you know, a rulemaking administrative um, body that does actually, you know, make policy. So just an understanding of what exactly is expected. But the second bullet is really where we start to see some of the problematic language that it gives us some challenges, which is that second sentence in which, you know, in making um, these appointments to the commission, the governor shall consider appointing members who possess natural resource backgrounds. Um, ideally, it would just kind of end there <laughs> and just be broader, you know, have possessed natural resource backgrounds, experience in, knowledge of, but it's where we start to list all the different groups, you know, in commercial fishing, in recreational fishing, hunting, agriculture, forestry, and conservation. So what ends up happening is that now all of these particular interests think, okay, well then I get a seat, you know, I'm listed out. So therefore that's how this should, this should play out. And so this is really where it gets tricky because it's, you know, you get a seat and you get a seat and everyone gets a seat. And then what happens if you do the math is that conservation loses. So love my little Oprah reference, but it's sometimes how this feels in the, the political sphere. Um, when we're, you know, talking to state senators and to the governor, it's like, well, commercial fishing, you know, they didn't get a seat this last round. So they need to get a seat this time. And it's like, this was never the intention. Yes, you can have a knowledge of these, these particular, you know, industries or, um, interest, but it's not to say that each particular one is supposed to have a seat. And so what ends up happening is these special interests drive these commission appointments um, because it requires the state Senate approval for them to actually be put on the commission. There's this interplay of, you know, senators really taking hold of this and, you know, using politics over science and over the public's values to drive certain candidates to getting on, on this commission. And we've seen this play out time and time again. And again, it's why this is a really big focus area for us when we talk about reforming, you know, at a really foundational level, like we need to get down into the like, how are they even appointed and how can we change this process? Um, you know, we also really need the public's engagement because the more that the public is engaged and paying attention to this, you know, the more we daylight, okay, that was really funny. The sun sort of came out right when I said daylight. 
wrong, but it sort of daylights this back room wheeling and dealing process that often happens out, you know, outside the public's eye. Um, and that is why, you know, another big push for us. And so what one of the examples of how, you know, us trying to, again, bring forward the, you know, the issues with this process and, and how politics is being used to appoint these people um, we had an instance where there were, I think it was five seats that were open on the commission or were going to be open. And so obviously it was going to be a really big deal. Um, and so, you know, the governor had put forward some candidates and, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag. A couple of them were okay. A couple of them were that classic, you know, you represent a seat and you represent a seat. But there was one in particular that was really egregious, um, you know, it was, it was at a time where Idaho had just had a bunch of issues because I can't remember now if it was the governor or some of their, their chair of their um, Fish and Game Commission, but, you know, had all these pictures on social media of trophy hunting and, and just some terrible stuff. And lo and behold, that the person that our governor was also going to appoint to our commission also on social media had huge, you know, lots of pictures of, you know, trophy hunting rhinoceros and hippo, and then even in Oregon, you know, holding up five coyotes from a coyote killing contest, just really things that go against Oregon's values. And because we had public engagement, because we had, you know, we as the Oregon Wildlife Coalition, you know, made sure the media was paying attention and, um, you know, we're really engaged in this issue we got enough pressure that the Senate had to say, oh my gosh, governor, like we cannot have that person come forward. And so we stopped his nomination. And so it was you know, a rare time in which that worked. But what's important about this is we needed people to see exactly how this all happens. And, and again, the wheeling and dealing that isn't necessarily in front of the public all the time. The other thing I will say is that we all often see this happen in wildlife conservation altogether, but it's even though we have we have allies in the in in the legislature, we have people who absolutely care about the commission and care about you know having better policies for wildlife. But the folks that are going to be more willing to make a big stand about it, to to make this like a top agenda item for themselves, are often those who kind of run against wildlife conservation. It's often rural Republican you know, often conservative, often those tied to sort of the consumptive entities. And so they're often more willing to, to really use this as a wedge issue and say like, no, you know, we're not doing X over here unless you do something about getting our people on this commission. So again, just want to really spell out like all the politics involved and how we're really trying to, to get after this. And to Quinn's point that it, how it is such this like exclusionary, like small group of people that this ends up, you know, benefiting. Also, you know, how this plays out is difficulty in candidate recruitment and some of the inequities there. So for this commission and for many, there's little to no pay. I mean, they get like a very small stipend. And for the, when we were traveling, uh, they would get, you know, travel reimbursed, but that's about it. So when you're trying to think about like actually getting broader representation on these commissions and on this one in particular, saying, hey, come do a bunch of time consuming things that take up a lot of energy and a lot of work for little to no pay, um, assuming you, know, you have an employer that is understanding. And if not, then you're either retired or independently wealthy. It just makes it really difficult. And what it means is we continue to have just the same pool of candidates, which again, reinforces that it's gonna continue to just be to benefit this small group that has been benefiting for a really long time. So that's kind of, again, the doom and gloom and like setting up the big problem and like, why do we think this is important to address? And, you know, I, the good news is there are opportunities for change. There's already been steps that we as a coalition have taken to move in the direction of reform. And so it is possible, you know, even though it might feel very overwhelming, we're already starting to see movement in that way, which is great. So one thing is just this broadening that statutory um, language. So Oregon, you know, after redistricting or after the census and redistricting, we're getting another congressional district, which means um, the way that statute is written, because it says it's a seven member body, 
is going to be out of step, of course, with the actual with the actual law of, you know, in congressional districts. So there's going to be an opportunity soon to just look at, OK, do we still want this same geographic distribution? Is there, you know, anything we want to do there? And then finally, you know, perhaps actually reviewing and taking an opportunity to review that that actual language to decide how, you know, how the governor is supposed to think about, you know, appointing candidates. So that's one opportunity that's really right on our doorstep. In fact, probably should have been addressed in the 2022 session, but it's likely going to be, well, it's going to be addressed in 2023. Um, so that's an opportunity for change. And again, will correcting that language mean like everything's going to be perfect? Probably not, but it will at least give us as advocates an opportunity to like be able to point back to the language and say, mm, no, actually, this is supposed to be for broader representation, not this very narrow focus of groups and in special interests. <clears throat> Uh, like Quinn, oh, I don't know if Quinn said this actually, but uh, the Environmental Justice Task Force and others are really looking at improving compensation, both for this commission, for other boards, just because again, this is really exclusionary. It's, it, it's you know, in an, it's an equity issue and it's going to continue to make it difficult to recruit candidates for any one of these boards or commissions if we don't talk about some type of fair compensation for, for time and effort in serving. And otherwise it's gonna to continue to be just like, I think as Tristy said, like a, a hobby legislature or a hobby commission. Um, our legislature is similar. You know, they also get very low pay for their time and for certain, you know, being an elected official. And in fact, just recently, three different state legislators announced they're not gonna seek reelection because a bill that they were, you know, hoping would pass to improve this compensation for legislators didn't go through and they just can't, you know, this one legislator, she works another full-time job. She's a mom of, of two toddlers. And she's like, this just doesn't even cover my daycare costs. So we really have to think about how this plays out for people and what that's going to mean for public service. And again, just for everything related to that, uh, you know, we're continuing to encourage public participation. I think no, you know, public participation is on our side. The more we have folks engaged on this issue and understanding why reform is needed, the better it's going to be. And so again, just similar to that one situation where we were able to stop a bad nomination, it's, it's been helpful as well in getting better people appointed to the commission because we had that active engagement from the public saying in a non-threatening way, but saying, we're watching you, you know, this matters to us and we're going to Hold you accountable if you're not actually appointing people that represent the, those broad public values. And then finally, and again, just like kind of, again, you know, just tying it all up, what type of candidates we're talking about, you know, we want candidates who are going to reflect the demographics of the state. Uh, obviously, we don't want our conservation caucus or whatever that was called, Quinn, that you posted with Theodore Roosevelt to be looking like that for the rest of time. Um, and so, wanting it to actually better reflect what Oregon looks like and what our values are. And so um, working towards that, uh, working to make sure that the folks who are appointed respect evidence-based science. You know, I don't think we expect everybody on this commission to be wildlife biologists themselves, but at the very least can understand or at least can work with science to turn it into policy. Um, who, you know, it's not surprising in all these instances that everyone's got their own science these days. So just really understanding what kind of science is credible science. And again, being able to turn that into policy is really important for a commission like this. And then I've said it, I don't know, a thousand times already, but just people who are going to represent those broader values of the public and most of whom don't hunt or fish. Uh, it's a very small percentage. So we really need to move in that direction so that people are going to continue to be invested and engaged on wildlife issues for years to come. So how is that playing out for us? You know, what, what are some of the steps, like I mentioned, that we are taking and where have we been successful? So, you know, it's not perfect. It's not, we're not saying like, this is, we are done. We don't need any more reform, but we are saying that at least for our Oregon Fish and Wildlife Commission, we are on the path moving in the right direction, which is what we want to see. Um, you know, I would say historically, our commission was 
similar to that picture Quinn put up, predominantly white, male, retired. Um, and it's, again, not reflective of all of Oregon and in, in seeing that. And it ends up being this very exclusionary group. And so the fact that even our commission now, out of the seven commissioners, five are female, we have more racial diversity than we've had in the past. We have more um, age diversity. It's still not great, but we're getting there. And some of that, again, is related to that compensation. And even with folks who would probably identify as, you know, hunter and anglers on our commission, they're at least still trying to move in the direction of better understanding of all these issues that wildlife face, you know, a, a deep care and passion for addressing climate change and justice issues. So we are starting to see that movement in Oregon with our commission. And, and you know, while we're happy about it, we have more work to do. And especially if we're going to get another commissioner or reorganize it, we're, we still have a long ways to go. But it's great to see that it's moving in that direction. So finally, I just want to end on, um, you know, how are tribes leading the way? And I feel like this comes full circle to what Quinn talked about. And again, just our ugly history in this country and really the, you know, exploitation and the extermination of humans and wildlife at simultaneously. Um, so it's great to see in Oregon and, you know, in other states as well, but tribes starting again to lead the way on species and cultural restoration, which is you know, really exciting. And so, for example, you have uh, that one picture with the gigantic condor trying to take off. You know, that's an effort being led by the Yurok tribe in who's in Northern California, but the reintroduction of condors in Northern California could mean they're back in Oregon pretty soon. So it has, you know, obviously some impact to Oregon specifically, but, you know, they're the ones that are in you know, in partnership with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but really leading the charge. And um, as they even say, you know, it's about species recovery, but it's also about, you know, taking back their role as, as caretakers of, of the land and of wildlife. So that's really exciting. In Oregon, again, with the Alaka Alliance. Um, so Alaka is a Chinook uh, jargon word for sea otter. And, you know, this Sea otters were again another species that was pushed to the brink of extinction. Can't find them on the Oregon coast. And so this is an effort being led by the Confederated Tribes of the Sluts Indians and other coastal tribes to bring back sea otters to, you know, to pursue a reintroduction effort. So really exciting again. And then finally, and you know, long-standing efforts by the Klamath tribes um, to preserve and restore sucker fish known as Tuam. Um, and as well as beaver and others to really, again, enrich the ecosystem, protect uh, the, the water and other wildlife and fish down there. So it's just really exciting to see, again, that full circle and hopefully coming back um, to and really reforming how we pursue and, and what, you know, the restoration of wildlife in the state looks like. So sorry if I went over, Shristi, but that's that's my presentation. And again, this is um, just us trying to make sure that these systems are worse, which hopefully means we will have wildlife policies that are more beneficial for more species. So thank you. Thanks, Danielle. Um, I'm going to try and now share my screen. Um, there we go. And uh, just a quick note, uh, we don't have a panel after this, so please take your time and uh, we will definitely have time for questions afterward. Thank you all. Perfect, thank you. Um, so, okay, let me try and get there. Did that work with the screen sharing? Oh, no. Mm. Let me know if, Anyone can see my screen? It seems like it's starting to load. Okay. Any luck with it? We just see a white. Okay. Link. Let me stop that and restart that. Um, so it's giving me the basic advanced and file option. Now I'm not sure if I should start it. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Um, 
I hope that works. Thank you everyone um, for joining us today. Uh, my name is Shrishti Kamal and I am the senior representative with Defenders of Wildlife. I also work very closely with Danielle and Quinn on various wildlife conservation issues in the state as part of the Oregon Wildlife Coalition. Um, my part of the presentation will focus largely on equity and inclusivity issues uh, in wildlife conservation, particularly as it relates to outdoor recreation and um, accessibility to outdoors. Why? Because uh, one of the reasons we conserve wildlife is outdoor recreation. So let's start with that. Why conserve wildlife? Um, as I mentioned, one of the main reasons we conserve is recreation, but broadly speaking, the use of wildlife can be classified into two broad buckets, which is the consumptive use or the non-consumptive use. Consumptive, as by definition, um, means you're extracting or harvesting a resource. Um, so in this case, think about recreation such as hunting and fishing. Uh, some people also hunt and fish for subsistence or sustenance. And then there's, of course, economic gains associated with wildlife trade or use of wildlife parts. The more non-tangible or, or at least difficult to quantify use of wildlife is the non-consumptive value of wildlife. Um, and this relates mostly to the services that wildlife provides to us just by being in the environment that they are. So for example, maintaining prey population densities for us, um, culling the diseased and ill in populations of prey, giving us access to better water quality. All of that are, ecosystem, are examples of ecosystem services that wildlife provides and by no means that's an exhaustive list. Then in terms of recreation, we also have the non-consumptive recreation that a lot of Oregonians are very familiar with, um, which includes um, you know, hiking, kayaking, bird watching, wildlife viewing, um, all of those kind of activities. And then one would also argue that wildlife has its own intrinsic value for being a life form and we should conserve it so that our future generations can enjoy it. So this is broadly how wildlife, uh, the value of wildlife can be broadly classified. So if we're looking at the consumptive and non-consumptive use of wildlife, how are we as a state prioritizing consumptive versus non-consumptive? Um, if you look at the graph on the left, um, that's a graph that OPB prepared back in, I believe, to 2016, um, where they visually represented the number of game species in our state in proportion to the non-game species. Game species are species that are allowed to be hunted or fished in our state. As you can see, it is significantly higher number of game species in our state versus, uh, sorry, non-game species in our state versus game. Roughly about 88% of Oregon's wildlife is actually not hunted or fished. But when you compare that to the resources that's devoted to managing these two kind of um, wildlife and fish species, there is a significant higher percentage of resources diverted towards game species. About 80% of ODFNW's resources are for game species management. Um, so as you can see, there's a huge discrepancy here. Um, and I would also like to add the caveat that conservation and management are used very often with the term wildlife um, and they're both necessary, but they don't mean the same thing. Management usually refers to some sort of management goal or strategy you might have such as uh, maintaining X number of individuals in a population before it's allowed to be hunted. So that's a management strategy. But conservation refers to a more broader term where you're not only talking about sustaining the population for the future, but also in a way that they can continue to give all the benefits they give to us, including the non-consumptive benefits. Um, so why is there such a huge focus on game? Um, in our state? Well, the answer lies in our agency's budget. I think Danielle mentioned this briefly, um, but if you look at our agency's budget, and this is ODFNW's budget for this biennium, 48% uh, of their money is coming from hunting and fishing licenses and tags. So if that's your a huge bulk of your income source, that's where you will prioritize. So that is exactly why that's happening. So there is an imbalance in the resources that the, our agency has for conserving and managing wildlife, which is also creating an imbalance in how our wildlife is uh, prioritized for consumptive versus non-consumptive use. Um, so why are, am I today focusing so highly on the consumptive, uh, non-consumptive use? 
simply because in addition to the fact that when you think about consumptive use of wildlife, you're removing an individual. So obviously it cannot continue to give the non-consumptive value. But in addition to that, when you look at the non-consumptive use of wildlife, specifically recreation, such as hunting and fishing, it tends to serve or benefit certain communities more than others. So this is again, data from ODFNW and graph from ODFNW, where they represent their most recent, that is 2020 service buyers, as well as returning service buyers. So the graph on the left are new people who are buying hunting and fishing licenses and tags. And then the one on the right is a returning people who are buying hunting and fishing licenses and tags. If you look at both of those graphs, a huge portion of that is individuals who identify as white or Caucasian, even more for the returning um, clients. When you compare that with, uh, for example, Hispanic or Latinx community, it's only 6%. And uh, same goes for Asian or Pacific Islander. And it decreases even further for returning service buyers, such as, um, again, Hispanic and Asian being 3%. So that shows that when you're looking at who's benefiting the most from consumptive use or who is involved in the consumptive use, it's not the underserved and underrepresented communities. So while ODFNW recognizes that and is acknowledging that, so they're trying to figure out new ways to be more inclusive in the more traditional methods of recreation, that is hunting and fishing. But we are also urging that you need to expand your thinking to include the fact that for certain communities, recreating it with wildlife is more aligned with the non-consumptive views, where they would like to see the wildlife being there and benefit from it in that manner. Um, so that brings us to talking about what outdoor recreation means for different people and different cultures. Simply speaking, outdoor recreation means different things for different communities based on, of course, your individual preferences, but also your cultural and historical background. Certain communities are more inclined to do certain activities than others. In my previous example of um, the hunting and fishing being mostly white or Caucasian in ODFNW's list of buying licenses and tags, hunting and fishing is also a traditional method of recreation for predominantly white culture. For other cultures, it's mostly for subsistence or sustenance. Uh, not so much for recreation alone. So that's an example. Um, again, I put a collage of pictures that um, signify what outdoor recreation means for me. Um, but again, that just shows that it means very different things for different individuals. Probably does not resonate with half of you. You know, so it, it's a different challenge in understanding what outdoor recreation means for different groups. For some people, it might just mean going to your local state park and having a picnic. You know, so that we have to be able to respect that and we have to be able to accommodate that when we're talking about wildlife conser conservation and the benefits it brings for people. Um, other challenges when it comes to accessibility to the outdoors, first and foremost being financial. Everything with outdoor recreation often tends to be expensive, whether it's the gear, whether it's travel, food, what have you, everything costs. And it's difficult for certain communities to bear that cost. Um, the other big issue is, of course, safety. Safety is a huge issue for a lot of communities, people of color, underserved and underrepresented communities who may or may not feel safe going outdoors in spaces with limited human presence or having the fear of being harassed or abused or physically harmed. So safety is definitely an issue. And then as I briefly touched upon earlier, uh, for certain communities, outdoor recreation is just culturally not prioritized. And if you look at the reasons why, it's mostly related to the above two, you know, but with a longer history of either not having the financial means or um, having uh, safety or security concerns around that. So there are challenges to outdoor recreation and trying to make it more representative and more accessible to everyone. Um, but as a state, we have started to take smaller steps in the right direction. The first ones came about in 2019 when the legislature established the Oregon Conservation and Recreation Fund, or OCRF. Um, OCRF is housed under ODFNW, but it is our state's first attempt to prioritize um, you know, non-consumptive 
uh, species uh, as much as consumptive species and also prioritize access to outdoor recreation for all Oregonians. So this is basically a funding mechanism or a funding body or program within ODFNW where local groups, grassroots groups or initiatives can apply for funding, uh, especially if their program um, relates very closely to the Oregon Conservation Strategy. For those of you not familiar with the Oregon Conservation Strategy, it's basically our state's guiding document on key strategic species and habitats to be protected. So um, when projects align with either certain species or habitat conservation that's in the uh, Oregon Conservation Strategy, they have a higher chance of getting grants from OCRF. Same goes for projects that can um, benefit communities that have not been able to access outdoors historically. So OCRF has been one step uh, in the right direction for our state in terms of accessibility to outdoors. The next one came about in our 2021 legislative session, which was last year. Um, the, there was a bill, House Bill 2171, which basically made OCRF permanent. Prior to that, OCRF had a sunset clause that was removed. It also secured additional funding for OCRF from the legislature. But more importantly, it also established an outdoor recreation advisory committee, uh, which is housed under the Office of Outdoor Recreation which would monitor, evaluate, and provide recommendations for several things, including improvements to e current equity, diversity, and inclusion efforts regarding outdoor recreation planning, and safe and comfortable outdoor tourism and recreation for communities of color, uh, members of LGBTQ community, people with dis disabilities, and other historically marginalized groups. So we are hopeful that the recommendations from this particular advisory committee will be incorporated by the agencies that are involved in any form of outdoor recreation, any natural resource agency, and actually make progressive changes in, the, in their programs on the ground. Um, the next bill that came about also in the same session was Senate Bill 289. And this bill sort of addresses the issue of safety head on. Um, it introduces penalties for any hate or bias crimes in outdoor recreation space, um, mainly meaning to act as a deterrent for people to engage in that. Anybody found in violation of uh, or, or conducting any bias crimes or hate crimes in outdoor space would um, get their hunting fishing licenses revoked and you cannot reapply for another three years. Uh, they'll also lose their boating license if they have that um, by the Marine State Board from anything from six months to five years. So again, it's not addressing all the issues we have with regards to safety, but it is definitely a very significant step forward in A, acknowledging it's a problem in the state and B, then trying to find a solution um, that will help people get more comfortable with going out um, in our you know, vast natural landscapes in Oregon. So um, those are some of the steps forward, and but that doesn't mean that you know we have reached the end of the path. There, there is a long road ahead when we talk about making outdoors accessible to all. Um, you know, but the, my key takeaways from this is that for people to remember that outdoor recreation means different things for different people based on their cultures and their history. And so inclusivity in this sense would mean opening up the traditional forms of recreation to all groups, but also support other forms of wildlife recreation that meets those groups needs. And then promoting non consumptive recreation of wildlife can especially help us build an even bigger, even bigger constituency of conservationists in our communities of color and other underrepresented communities who have historically not been able to engage um, in decision-making around wildlife conservation, at, as Quinn had pointed out. And then lastly, that the cost of biodiversity loss and climate change impacts, unfortunately, is borne by our underrepresented communities disproportionately. So in that, keeping that in mind, we also have to make more intentional efforts to ensure that the benefits of wildlife recreation also extends to all communities in Oregon. So with that, I am going to end my presentation and would welcome any questions or thoughts uh, from the participants for any of the panelists.
think we're moderating ourselves. <laughs> oh no, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so we uh, we have uh, a couple of questions in it that came through. So um, the first one is that it seems like even the organizations and the agencies that claim the NAM guidelines, um, they don't seem to follow them. Do you um, do you agree? And uh, how is commercial trapping allowed? Uh, uh, predators hunting, creating surplus wildlife, etc. Um, do you want me to take that one? Please. So, who, who are... Yeah, thank you for that question. And, and I would absolutely agree. You know, I think when I look at that North American model, in fact, I was sort of surprised when I first really looked at it and I thought, this doesn't look too bad. It also isn't even remotely what happens on, on the ground. <laughs> so I completely agree that it's not being um, applied. Um, if it were, I think we would be in better shape. But nonetheless, it's still completely within this frame of consumptive uses of wildlife. Um, you know, it was written by and for um, sportsmen. So, you know, it's still very limited when we look at it in that sense, especially, you know, what, when we look at what our current needs are, um, we're facing this loss of biodiversity. But yeah, I, I completely agree. It's, it's aspirational. And I think in practice, um, it's more often used as a, a cudgel, almost like a reminder that we're only here because of sportsmen and therefore our, our needs, our, our priorities um, should come first. So that's how I've seen it in practice. And there's definitely, you know, even within the hunting community, although maybe not necessarily the organizations themselves, but, you know, individual hunters will definitely say that yes, this needs to be updated and you know what I mean? And reviewed and, but not necessarily getting those statements again from like the actual hunting organizations themselves. Um. Yeah, and I would just add that it feeds into this vicious cycle of if you are using that model as the only model for wildlife conservation, then you'll always look at hunting and fishing as the only source of income and the only mode of financing wildlife conservation, which then feeds into the need for more hunting and fishing. So it's a vicious cycle that we need to break out of. It can be a complementary or supplementary measure along with other approaches that we need to take a closer look at. Yeah, and almost like wildlife only exists as it relates to us and our need or, does, or you know, interest in, in exploiting it in a way, you know, as opposed to wildlife, all wildlife deserves to thrive for being wildlife <laughs> unrelated to us, so. Awesome, and um, there was also uh, another question from Rob. Um, he stated that one difference that he sees between the mission of groups like um, Oregon Wildlife and the others we have here today and um, the Fish and Wildlife Agency is that the, the former is an eco rather than human centric um, model and the conservationists seem to be recognized that the value of wildlife and natural systems for their own sake. So um, is the Fish and Wildlife mission um, is about uh, human enjoyment rather than you know, conservation for the greater good and um, you know, even with that, does uh, killing an animal by a hunter take away some someone else's enjoyment of uh, that animal being alive? And I think that you know, Zerski really um, meant you know that that really goes to the heart of what she brought up in her presentation. But please, if you all have any inputs on that, yeah, well, I think what's interesting, especially given even just the name of this panel and and us trying to connect, you know, the human humans to wildlife, you know, and, and actually like build that interconnectedness. So it's an interesting because I think what he's getting at is like, you know, we don't necessarily want for, from Tristy's point, like everything to be about like this consumptive nature and this feedback loop of like how we see and want and need wildlife per se. So trying to, yes, have the like wildlife deserve to exist for wildlife and yes, wanting to kind of, uh, take away the focus of that human, you know, central, 
what's the word I'm looking for? You know, focusing humans in that particular way. But the flip side of it, of course, is that what we're talking about today is like that we do like how we treat wildlife and and decisions that are related to that and, and pertain, you know, protecting biological diversity do also impact human systems and, and human communities. And so also wanting to reconnect it back that way, which is something I know Quinn and Tristy are nodding because like even when we discussed this panel, we were like, how do we sort of, you know, touch on all those things? Because it's a li it's kind of a little bit convoluted, but, and I don't know if either of you have a more eloquent way to say that, but yeah. No, I think that that's very true, Danielle. And I just wanted to add that part. I think what Rob mentioned there is, it's true. There's two versions of looking at a wildlife conservation. One is the anthropocentric view, which is every life form has a value because it serves something for someone else, mostly human communities. And then there is the ecocentric view. But within ecocentric view, the, we are looking at the ecological benefits we get from wildlife, but at the same time, there is a human dimension within eco ecocentric view. There, you know, there are socioeconomic factors that influence those, but that does not take away from the fact that it's still an ecocentric view and not an anthropocentric view, where you're looking at the only value wildlife provides is because it has some value for humans. The ecocentric view looks at it as it has value for the ecosystem it lives in, which can benefit humans, but also benefit other life forms and the planet itself. But there are human factors that will influence and interact with those, those ecological factors. So we definitely work in that gray area of understanding how humans interact with uh, ecological systems and how wildlife also do the same and where there are challenges or conflicts or and where there are you know, opportunities of change. But that does not mean it's still the anthropocentric view. The anthropocentric view is not what we take. You know, in the, the context of um, the zoonotic disease bill and, and, and working through that process, you know, I learned a lot about this emerging one health perspective, right? Which is kind of looking at the interface of humans, animals, both wild and domestic, and the environment, and really understanding that you can't arbitrarily separate any of those things out. They're all connected. And so I'm, I'm finding that approach to be really compelling um, even in looking at my own work, um, and it's kind of a different way of looking at sort of a traditional model of, of wildlife management instead of saying, well, it's because wildlife can't take, you know, have the fundamental right to exist on their own or because humans benefit. Both things can be true, um, but for the whole system to work together, all of these pieces have to be in place. And I think you were up also an interesting point, which is a bit tangential to this, but it's also our approach to this idea that do we actually need to manage wildlife, which is something we all grapple with a lot. And I know Quinn and I even had a meeting one time with the commissioner where it was sort of like, do we even need to, why do we have to meddle? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what, that's some of our approach, which is like, we don't necessarily need active management. I mean, especially when you think about predator prey relationship or really, you know, the, there's, they have a way of maintaining populations. They have a main, a way of again, like coexisting within their ecosystem and with other, you know, species. And so this idea that like humans get in and sort of like move chess pieces around, there's some, you know, movement on our end to also just say like, can we, can we just not actually, and just let them be. So <laughs> super eloquent, right? And I think, uh, you know, uh, to Rob's point, and um, you all have brought up a very interesting point that I've particularly uh, interested about in that, you know, when the services do me measure, uh, you know, what a sufficient management program is, they mainly look at it as like, what can we, what's the level where, um, you know, a species could uh, survive while humans enjoy, you know, their, their benefits. And that kind of goes to the anthropocentric view that agencies implement. And, um, you know, especially with the salmon here, I think, um, you know, as a keystone species, uh, services really fail to understand the the greater impact the species has. You know, not just for tribes, but just for the whole ecosystem. And um, I, I was curious to um, you know hear a little bit more, if you all have time, about um, you know the the endeavor that's going on in Upper Willamette. It seems like there has been some increments made for the progress for the recovery of the salmon, but um, you know, the, the ultimate goal I'm assuming is, you know, 
hydration, uh, deauthorization, and um, you know, moving more towards that step where uh, you know we were not constantly talking about this every year. And I was wondering, from your experience, what what are uh, the state's sentiment towards moving towards and um, towards that goal? And what do you think are some of the challenges uh, for us to actually achieve? Um, you know, full recovery for the salmon and steelhead and upper uh, Willamette. It's a handful, I know, I'm sorry. Take the dams out. Yeah. Good. <laughs> that would be a, a, a great starting point. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. It's a great starting point, something a lot of our uh, groups here are involved in actively in working for the removal of the dams. And I think what you are get, getting at, and I fully agree, is that there is no one point solution. You cannot say that if you do this one action that's going to save the salmon, it's a myriad of solutions and a lot of things have to happen at the same time. But the critical part is of course, maintaining their migration routes, which is why the dams are, are the biggest challenge that we have all identified. But that said, in our state, um, you know, there is recognition and to an extent, relatively good leadership in the state for um, acknowledging we need to do something, that there has to be an alternate solution to what we have been trying so far and it hasn't worked. Um, and, but as you recognize, it's a multi-state problem and not Oregon alone. And so there has to be a more regional cohesion in our thinking and in our, our action on the ground. And Quinn, you might know more um, just from your work on salmon and orca stuff. I, I think that's a, a really good summary other than to say that it's it's an enormously complex issue and there's no one solution. I mean, I think, you know, um, a lot of our groups tend to focus on, on dam removal because it's sort of the, probably one of the biggest immediate impact um, actions that we could take, um, but it's also highly controversial, right? So there's so many interests at stake um, yeah, I, I mean, it's it's really hard to untangle. So we're we're kind of in the midst of that right now. And uh, I wish I had an, an an easier answer for you, but um, kind of speaks to the challenges of our, our work. We're balancing so so many interests, and I think that's an issue also where um, environmental justice concerns come to the forefront. But even there, um, it's not clear cut. You know, um, the interests are also complex there. So it's, we're just untangling this, this big knot, again, a knot of our own making. Well, it's funny you said clear cut, because another thing, and it's <laughs> probably being signed into law, I think like right now is, you know, there was a big package of reforming Oregon's forest practices on private land, you know, again, to try to, to address some of these issues and the, for example, the effect a clear cut would have on a fish bearing stream or river or other waterway. And so there are a ton of inputs as they've both said, you know, I'll share with you, I, the part that becomes frustrating sometimes for, you know, wildlife advocates is there's, there are big issues that need to be addressed, you, you know, obviously habitat, climate change, dams, all these different things. But every now and again, our fish and wildlife agency will say, well, cormorants, you know, this one species of bird eats salmon. So we're just going to go and call and, you know, kill all of these birds as the solution. And it's just, it's sort of mind blowing when you're going that that's, you know, that, that's like 50th down the road here. Um, so it's again, that push pull that we have sometimes in trying to say like, we need to be addressing these big issues and how do we do that? Um, yeah, so. Well, um, if there are no more questions, um, thank you all so much for your time. Uh, you know, this was just such a, you know, fruitful conversation that we, we all had today. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, uh, Danielle, you brought up, you know, the issue of force. Uh, we do have a panel at uh, five o'clock that does cover some of the, you know, forest issues in their uh, role in, carbon offset and you know 
throughout the, the whole week, we, we cover uh, a lot of issues regarding forests and species as well, where, you know, uh, Oregon Wild and other organizations are also involved with. So I uh, invite you all to please check out our brochure for um, any future panels that you're interested in. And uh, like I said earlier, um, this um, is recorded and will be posted on uh, our YouTube channel shortly. Um, again, thank you so much to everyone and our panelists, especially for taking their, you know, the time out of their day to uh, join us for this discussion. And uh, I hope to see you all soon. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.